When we envision habitable worlds in the universe, we tend to think of Earth-like exoplanets that bear surface oceans like Earth, but different land masses and very different alien life. This is shifting, however, as we discover new abodes, potentially for life, under the ices of Europa, Enceladus, and others, that lie outside the traditional solar habitable zone where Earth sits. They present a very different kind of habitability than what was imagined just a few decades before. With the ice shell moons, there are many unanswered questions, other than they seem to support liquid water oceans. But what effects do the conditions of being on the moon of a giant world like they are have? What do extreme tidal effects and heating do to an exomoon of a gas giant, presenting very different conditions than Saturn or Jupiter do? This has led to the concept of the habitable edge, where an inner border of habitability can be established around a gas giant, forming a circumplanetary habitable zone. Get too close and they are uninhabitable, at least in the ice shell context. Io is something like this. It's a volcanic world that once had as much water as the other Galilean moons, but lost it over time due to the effects of its proximity to Jupiter. Here it's fun to imagine changing the conditions of some of the solar system's moons by moving them around. If you took Ganymede, the solar system's largest moon, and put it in solar orbit within the sun's habitable zone, it would melt, but would actually be able to retain an atmosphere and an ocean long term. This is interesting because models of moon formation suggest that gas giant environments, especially those larger than Jupiter, known as Super Jovian worlds, actually suggest that moons the size of Ganymede and even ones far larger should be common in the universe. And there are candidates for exomoons, though no confirmation of any of them just yet. Another interesting scenario is that of red dwarf planetary systems. We can think of these systems in terms of Trappist-1 or Proxima Centauri, where Earth-sized worlds sit tidally locked to their star, complicating their habitability. Those so-called eyeball worlds are possible here, as is convection to the night side, making nightlife potentially possible in the permanent dark. The day side, however, seems generally unlikely in the constant light of the Red Dwarf, though we don't yet know all of the possibilities there. But what happens if such a tidally locked world has an exomoon? Oddly, the exomoon would have an advantage. It would likely be tidally locked to its planet rather than the red dwarf, meaning it would receive light for both its sides, much like our moon does, even though it's tidally locked to Earth, but not the sun. This is situational, however. Some exoplanets, perhaps a majority, can't hold large moons. Small moons would suffer from the same potential problems its parent world might face, but worse, in that they may not be able to hold an atmosphere for long in that environment. But with exomoons, there is a sort of catch. There's a huge amount of variability on what they can be like, as we see with our solar system's ample batch of moons. The thing is, though, natural satellites should dramatically outnumber planets in the universe by a solidly large margin. They may even present more opportunities for life than planets themselves do, simply because of their sheer numbers. At the same time, the solar system offers no moons that offer surface habitability on level with Earth. There are candidates for a kind of habitability, like Saturn's atmosphere-bathed moon Titan, but it would be life of a very different sort than that of Earth, existing in very low temperatures and likely at very slow metabolism using liquid hydrocarbons as a solvent instead of water. You can even play with ideas of how low temperature life arises. Perhaps Titan is simply too young still to have life, even at 4.6 billion years old, because the chemistry moves that slowly in the unbelievably frigid temperatures. But Titan is rare in the solar system for its thick atmosphere. No other moons have this. Rather, any atmosphere they might have is very tenuous and almost non-existent but it's only partially clear why Titan has managed to hold on to an atmosphere. It's thought that Titan managed to gather up more ices than usually happens, and as heat from radioactive decay in its core and impacts melted it, it ended up with a nitrogen-dominated atmosphere. But at the same time, Titan is smaller than Mars, yet Mars lost its atmosphere. Part of the reason is that Mars' magnetosphere shut down long ago. Titan doesn't have a protective magnetosphere, but Saturn does and it's Saturn's magnetosphere that's believed to be protecting the atmosphere of Titan. 
The problem here is known as sputtering, where energetic particles from space wreak havoc on materials depleting atmospheres. But this effect can also happen with the gas giant itself. They have powerful radiation toruses that any moons within them get constantly bombarded and would very rapidly strip off a moon's atmosphere if they were too close. But moons can have magnetospheres of their own. An example here would be Ganymede. Even though it only has a mass a fraction that of Earth, it actually has a magnetosphere. Titan may also still be replenishing its atmosphere through gases escaping from deep below the surface, another factor. But here it pays to return to tidal forces. Most large moons, especially those around gas giants or brown dwarfs, are going to tend to be tidally locked. This can work for or against the habitability of moons, but it does allow tidal heating outside the habitable edge, which can help to maintain liquid water. Modeling shows that this can even, under the right atmospheric pressure and composition, allow for suitable temperatures for life. Tidal effects might also allow an exomoon to maintain plate tectonics and volcanism, not unlike Earth, which might also help regulate temperatures and even allow for a dynamo effect and the creation of a native magnetic field for these moons. The best candidates in which to find moons habitable in the standard way within a star's habitable zone are likely to be gas giant planets. There are known examples of this already, but none are yet known to have moons. These include the gas giant Gliese 876b. This exoplanet presents an interesting situation in that it's not habitable yet, but will be in the future if it has any moons. It was actually the first exoplanet discovered orbiting a red dwarf back in the early days of exoplanet hunting in the late 1990s. The planet is actually not in the habitable zone of this red dwarf, it's just outside it. But red dwarfs evolve and as they age, they brighten, as the sun does. And the habitable zone will, in the far future, think trillions of years, move outward and engulf this gas giant and its potential moons. Interestingly, because of the slow evolution time of red dwarfs, Gliese 876b's potential moons will sit in the habitable zone for a very long time, at least 4.5 billion years. And models of the system show that any large moons that might be there will be able to remain in stable orbits long term. But it pays to remember, we don't know if it has any moons, just that it seems likely for large exoplanets to form them, based on models and what we see in our solar system. As to what those moons are like, we don't know, because there is a wide variability on what is possible. But it's fun to think about a far future moon, around a gas giant we already know of, inside its habitable edge, when the planetary system itself moves into the habitable zone of its star, life arising and blossoming on a truly ancient moon. Other large exoplanets within habitable zones also include the exoplanet 55 Cancer F, which is a likely gas giant about half the mass of Saturn that orbits in the habitable zone of a binary star system. HD 37124c, a gas giant orbiting a sun-like G-type star. 47 Ursae Majoris, which is outside the habitable zone of its star, but it's close enough to the outer part of the habitable zone that it may not allow for actual habitable terrestrial exoplanets in that solar system to receive enough cometary material for much in the way of liquid water. Yet the exoplanet may allow, in certain circumstances due to infrared emissions and tidal effects, for its own moons to be habitable, even though it's just outside its circumstellar habitable zone. Upsilon Andromedae d is another candidate, a super Jupiter in the habitable zone of its star. And finally, HD 28185b, a high mass planet that might support habitable moons. Unfortunately, the surface habitability of exomoons will come down to circumstance. You need stellar illumination of these worlds, but you may also need planetary illumination, and you must account for eclipses on these exomoons. Having an enormous gas giant blocking out all the light for long and frequent periods might change the game, and not allow for enough radiation from the star to reach the surface of the moon. Think about that for a moment. All of the conditions of life otherwise, except the long and or frequent cumulative eclipses prevented by shutting out the light. I wonder if there is a possible extinction event scenario hidden somewhere in there, death by orbital disruption of some sort, and subsequent increasingly worsening and long duration eclipses. Anyone that's seen totality in a solar eclipse knows that partial or annular eclipses do not do that spectacle justice, and full totality is frankly disconcerting. 
Imagine for a moment a totality that lasts for months or happens for hours or days each month over and over, bringing a harsh winter indeed very quickly. It would probably be the most intense seasonal conditions you can get. And about the closest thing we can imagine here are the Arctic and Antarctic winters in total blackness for months. This would be worse than that on an unlucky exomoon. It could be very much worse, creating a hellish world, not because of the heat it sometimes gets, but the eclipsed deep cold that periodically but regularly descends on it. And when not an eclipse, or just an inhabited exomoon around a gas giant without that being too much of a problem, the sky would be dominated not so much by the sun of that system, as it does with us, with a relatively small moon gracing the night, though its star would obviously be prominent and very important in a habitable zone. But instead, the sky would be dominated by the giant host world of that exomoon, and could potentially be like our Jupiter, a frightening place with roiling gigantic storms, an angry world, with violent lightning on its night side that frequently flashes and illuminates your entire moon world in the night. Or maybe it's the opposite, quiet and serene like Saturn with not so much roiling at least, yet Saturn too could be absolutely deadly with the wrong eclipse. Thanks for listening, I am Futures in Science Fiction author John Michael Godier currently asking a question. What is the most beautiful planet in the solar system in your opinion? I'd have to say Earth, but let's rephrase it. The most beautiful non-Earth planet or moon in the solar system. Tell me in the comments below. In my opinion, it's potentially deadly eclipse Saturn. At least annihilation would look nice. It's like a beautiful, enticing, but horrifically poisonous flower or berry. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channel for regular, in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.